So I'm going to be talking a little bit about my personal mindset during clutches and how I believe applying some of the same thinking can lead to being more successful in clutch scenarios. The example I'm using is from a 3v3 custom game on the test server. You will hear the enemy team's comms as well as my team's comms since we were all in the same discord just screwing around on the new chalet in the test server so nothing too serious but i do think the ability to hear the other team's comms will actually help illustrate some of my points here now obviously this was not a very high pressure situation none of us were super concerned with winning and although it was overtime match point and even though it was a friendly screw around game with friends i did still kind of want to get this dub so i turned up the sweat a little bit here it's also a brand new map rework for all of us, and I believe I took full advantage of my opponent's general lack of knowledge of the map. So in other words, this is not maybe what you would consider to be a typical clutch. That said, I still believe I did some things in this clutch that warrant talking about and demonstrate nicely my thought process when clutching. And though this is a bit of an unorthodox match, I believe these ideas can be applied pretty much universally to really any level of play. The biggest thing I'm doing here is forcing 1v1 engagements. It is important to remember that your odds of winning in any 1vx scenario are extremely slim, if not essentially zero if your opponents play it correctly. So the only way you stand a chance is if you force favorable conditions for yourself, which means first and foremost not taking multiple gunfights at once. At worst you should be trying to force your opponents to give up roughly 50-50 or better 1v1 gunfights to you whenever possible, as it is often the only way you really stand any chance at all. Remember though that you are relying on your opponents to make mistakes, and you should not win in scenarios like this. But that said, I do believe you can maximize your chances of winning by eliminating mistakes of your own, even if it results in only a marginally higher chance of winning. You have to play nearly perfectly, and your opponents have to play sloppy in order for these situations to go your way. What is it hitting? What is it hitting? Okay. Blue stairs, coming down blue. Due to the nature of this particular game, and knowing my opponents pretty well, I expected that Max, the Zero, would try to push in here and try to frag me. Instead of, like, planting by snowmobile, for example, which he could have gone for, especially if he had someone cover me, uh, swinging on him from the door. But he knew my location and I was backed into a corner, so I'm sure he was thinking he could just frag me. But I also knew his location and I'm holding a pretty strong passive angle on him here. I'm not overextending, I'm not challenging him, I'm waiting for him to walk into my angle. But something else I'm doing is eliminating other angles that I can be killed from uncontested as I do this. Now I'm not completely safe, but if someone pushes through the garage wall, the blue stair door, or the main stairs, I essentially have that angle locked down no matter what. The only angle I'm exposed to in this situation is the door to wine. I had a pretty good idea that I wasn't in imminent danger from that angle because someone had been called out on the blue stairs. Now given that this is the new chalet rework, they could have pushed down farther and into wine through the blue hallway, but I figured I had at least a few seconds before that would be attempted. A way I could have maybe played this better is just playing a little bit farther back into the boxes. This could completely eliminate the angle from wine while maintaining the angle that I wanted to watch into Garage. It obviously didn't end up mattering in this scenario, however, as you will soon see. I think it was Ying. Oh, he's right in the fucking god damn it! So I get the frag on zero, and this is where it is helpful to hear the enemy team's comms. I get called out in connector and I immediately rotate out. In fact, I'm already out and in a new position when the call out comes out. But I would assume in, under normal circumstances, my opponent would have called me out quicker. Now, if someone had been ready to refrag near the bottom of main stairs and their shot was really on that day, I would probably be toast as I do this. But this brings me to my next point. Move around often and be elusive. You will want to react off of intel and not just go sprinting blindly into areas where enemies might be, but try to remain elusive and on the move whenever possible, even if it just means changing your angle slightly rather than rotating completely out of a spot. I know now a guy is in blue hallway, but the other is unknown. So I took a calculated risk to sprint across the doorway here, and I believe even if I had died here, this still would have been the right play. By changing my position, my location is now mostly unknown again. I have a deeper angle into blue where I know an enemy is pushing from. So if I die here, I die. But I believe that staying stagnant in connector where my position was known and my enemies could collapse on me would be a worse move than accepting the slight risk of dying as I rotate out. Do what? 
he's under the fucking hatch and whatever connector between. Okay, no, he's not. He's there, right there. Next to the blue wall light. Now this is a rare scenario, but one that needs to be taken advantage of when it arises. I was able to leverage my position to get a very favorable engagement on the Ying in blue. In clutch situations, you will be taking a lot of 50-50 gunfights, and a lot of times you will lose those gunfights. However, in this gunfight, you can see that I have the clear advantage. The Ying has no idea where I'm coming from, and it's looking the wrong way, and it's basically a free kill for me. I would not have been able to do this had I not pushed out of connector after killing the zero or reacted the way I did off of the intel and the sound cue indicating that this guy was pushing down blue. My movement is important to note here as well. I used the sound of the yin candela going off to mask my sprinting and as soon as that sound stops I start slow walking or alt walking so as not to give my position away with sound cues. He's under the fucking hatch and whatever connector between... It is possible the Ying could have still heard me. Um, alt walking as a two speed is not completely silent, of course. But again, it's all about being as elusive as possible while eliminating advantages that your enemy could use against you. Here I eliminated both the intel from the call out saying that I was in connector, as well as as much intel as I could that could be gained off of sound in order to get me a fairly free kill on the Ying. Okay, no, he's not. He's not. Right on stairs. Which one? Oh, yeah, Nick got him. He Nick was left. Him. After I kill the Ying, this becomes a quite manageable 1v1 scenario. The only issue is that I don't know the location of the last guy. Again, however, it is helpful to hear the enemy comms to illustrate my point here. Ying calls me out in blue hallway essentially immediately, but as soon as he does, I'm already doubling back out of blue and into wine. I don't know where my last enemy is, but I do have a good idea that he is now probably looking to frag me in blue. Again, I have a slight unique advantage here of being able to actually hear the enemy comms live because we're all in the same Discord, but this is all stuff that can also easily be inferred when you're in this situation, even without hearing the enemy comms. You have to assume that as soon as you get a kill, your enemy has called out your exact location. Even though this may not necessarily be the case, and especially in pub matches you don't know how well the enemy team is coordinating, there is no harm in playing as though this is the case every single time, because if you overextend and die, then that's just it. You can, you have to now it's here that I make what I would consider to be my two biggest mistakes in this round. Perhaps I was feeling a little too comfortable now that I had whittled this 1v3 down to a 1v1, but I should not have let myself get complacent here. And maybe I wouldn't have in a higher stakes match, but who knows. First off, I should have been pre-aiming the rotate hole here. I walk right past it while looking at nothing in particular, which makes this time I spend looking at the wall here completely wasted time. And even though I don't know the exact location of my final enemy, I should be prepared to take a gunfight from pretty much anywhere at this point. This ultimately doesn't end up mattering as you will see soon, but the last attacker turns out to be pushing from main stairs and I would have been an easy kill in this rotate hole if he had just been pre-aiming the right spot. He was likely still responding to the intel that I was in blue hallway, so I got away with this, but I still consider this to be a huge mistake that could have easily cost me this clutch. Reload. Evan. Then, still not knowing the final enemy's location, I toss a goo mine by the breach into garage, which is not currently visible here, but it's the same place that Zero pushed in through previously, just off to the left of where I'm looking. This briefly leaves me exposed and gives away my location, and while in hindsight it was a bad move, at the moment I was thinking that I could potentially gain a little bit of intel on the last guy if he happens to push through the garage breach. As luck would have it though, at the exact same moment, my goo on main stairs goes off. I can tell it is this goo in particular based off of the sound cues. Load. Lesion's mines used to be marked with an icon that would disappear as soon as they were activated, but even after the nerf that removed this, his gadget is still a really valuable intel gathering tool because the sound cue is loud, distinct, and easy to locate spatially. So if you remember where your goos are located, you can easily determine enemies' exact locations with this sound cue. Evan, you was to the left. So I got pretty lucky with timing here, given that the Hibana tripped the goo at almost the exact moment I threw the other one out. She may not have heard or seen me do this. It's also possible that she was just tunnel visioned onto blue where I was last called out and was still looking for me there as I did this. As I hear this sound cue, I immediately pull back into the corner next to the door. And I do this because I now know where the Hibana is and I'm worried she may, may have heard me and be pre-aiming the connector door. But instead of staying here, I again take a slight risk in hopes of an engagement favorable to me and it works out. 
All right. Oh. Oh. The Hibana still thought I was in blue and used her position behind the shelf to attempt to pull the goo out. And I get an easy free kill to win the round. So, to recap a little bit, the main ideas I'm working with here Isolate 1v1 engagements, especially engagements where you're at an advantage, 50-50 or better. You'll notice that I had the clear upper hand in every gunfight in this clutch. There wasn't even really any 50-50 engagements, and I won all these gunfights not because I outskilled or outgunned by opponents, but because I used my positioning and intel to my advantage. Stay mobile, be elusive. I almost never stayed in the exact same spot for long after getting a kill. I think the enemy's comms illustrate how hard of a time they were having keeping track of me, since nearly every call was outdated by the time it came out. Control the intel economy. Notice how I almost always had some level of intel on my enemies, and was always reacting as quickly as I could to it. Meanwhile, my opponents rarely had reliable intel on me. I controlled the intel game in my favor. Even though I didn't always have reliable callouts for my team, I always tried to receive more information than I was giving out to my opponents. So, in conclusion, did I play this clutch perfectly? No. Do I have any real authority as a random silver YouTube memer with 10 subscribers telling people how to play clutches? No. Is this the perfect quintessential example of a super high stakes clutch? No. But I do think that by dissecting my thinking in this situation, I can hopefully help both myself and others improve their decision making in clutch situations. Let me know what you think. Did I just get lucky? Did I play it well? Is my advice here any good? Thanks for watching. <laughs> Let's go! Not from that angle. He was in that doorway. <laughs>